This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We're broadcasting from the Sundance Film Festival in Park City, Utah, the largest festival of independent cinema in the United States. As we continue with our conversation with Sheena Joyce, the director of the film Atomic States of America, and Kelly McMaster's author of Welcome to Shirley, a memoir from an atomic town. I first started in radio, one of the first documentaries I did was looking at the Shoreham nuclear power plant and the Three Mile Island disaster, because a number of people from Three Mile Island went to Shoreham, Long Island, uh, to warn people, don't let this nuclear power plant go online. And when people succeeded in preventing the Shoreham nuclear power plant from going full power, I think most people in this country thought nuclear power was dead, at least on Long Island. Right. But Kelly McMaster's talk about this plant you just referred to, the Brookhaven National Lab plant, how it is that that was sort of, if you will, under the radar? It was very under the radar, and it was even the people in my town who worked mostly service jobs there didn't quite get what was going on there um, because it was a federal laboratory um, and because it is enclosed in these pine barrens, you literally can't see it. It's on an old army base, and you can't, you have no access to it. I mean, it's not providing electricity for the people no, of Long Island. No, and it has won, um, you know, Nobel Prizes in Physics, and it's done some fantastic medical research, but since 1955, it's also been leaking and having um, a really detrimental effect on the neighborhoods around it. Uh, it was actually when Shoreham became sort of a, a focal point of the island and people realized you know, we're all saying we don't want nuclear power on the island, A, because it's an island, there's no way off if something happens. Um, we are all on a sole source drinking water aquifer, so if something goes into the, into the water, then it hits everybody, all three million people on the island. Once they started saying we don't want nuclear on the island, and then they heard, wait, we already have it on the island, and then all the picketers sort of moved from Shoreham over to the lab. I want to go back to The Atomic States of America, a remarkable film that has premiered at the Sundance Film Festival. In this clip, you, Kelly, and a local resident introduce us to Carlton Road, which is nicknamed Death Row because so many sick people live there. So right now we're standing on Carlton, the street that was nicknamed Death Row. Pretty much almost every house on the street had somebody who was sick with cancer or something else. People started realizing that they weren't the only sick ones, their neighbors were sick as well. We would meet in people's basements and their kitchens and we'd talk about what we found and, you know, we'd, we'd do research and somebody would find something. All signs seemed to point to what was beyond this barbed wire fence. These are all rhabdomyosarcoma cases. A is my daughter. Shirley here, all the other cases are all within the, the confines of real close to the Brookhaven National Laboratory. I knew there was a laboratory at Brookhaven, but I pictured this as a bunch of guys in white coats with test tubes, heating them up and, you know, doing whatever type of experiments. The Brookhaven National Laboratory conducts sophisticated nuclear experiments, producing an enormous amount of deadly waste. The only research I had said that my daughter's cancer was caused by low-level radiation. And Brookhaven National Laboratory was the only source of that. The lab sits atop the primary underground water supply for 1.3 million residents of New York's Long Island. It's certainly not a risk to people outside the lab. What was explained to me is that we're the scientific minds out here. We know what we're doing. And you need to trust us that we wouldn't do anything to, to intentionally harm you. That's a clip from a new film called The Atomic States of America. Um, go further with Death Row. Well, what was amazing for me when I first watched the film was to see how similar the reactor communities were. In my community, what happened was people were suffering alone in their own houses, and then they would realize, oh, my neighbor is sick, and my other neighbor is sick, and they started meeting in each other's basements, and uh, something very iconic in the Long Island fight against cancer are these hand-drawn maps that mostly women suffering with breast cancer would start making when they looked at um, 
among all their neighbors who were also ill. In, in Long Island, in, one in nine women suffer from breast cancer? That's actually, that was the original number back in, I believe, the 80s. Um, and now I think the numbers are one in six or one in seven. Um, it's so it, it is there's a, a group called one in nine which was one of the first breast cancer advocacy groups but it's amazing that even in the time that that group I mean the group still exists the numbers have really jumped and uh, it was wild for me to watch the film and see in all of these other reactor communities that same iconic image of these hand-drawn maps that people who just are everyday people they know something's wrong in their community they're not sure they're not politicians they're not scientists they don't know how to combat it so what do they do they go home and they drew a map and over and over we saw that introduce us to the Snells mm. uh, Randy Snell was uh, a a bank manager um, in Manorville, which is right near, uh, it's a sister town to Shirley, it's right near the Brookhaven National Laboratory, and his daughter uh, became very ill with rhabdomyosarcoma, sarcoma, which is a soft tissue cancer. And when they were going to... She was how old? She was four. Three. Three, yeah. And uh, they... A um, little beautiful oh, kid. yes. And he would go to the hospital with her and all of a sudden all the parents realized how many of the kids had rhabdomyosarcoma and one of the doctors mentioned low-dose radiation as being um, a possible um, reason for his little girl's cancer. I mean this is a remarkably rare cancer Incredibly. in the United States. Yes, yes. And he went home and thought how you know what kind of, where was my daughter exposed to radiation and then he realized the national you know Brookhaven National Laboratory was right in his backyard and that's when he started running the numbers and he came up with um, more than 22 kids in this small compact area it's supposed to be I think one in four million uh, and it, it just statistically bizarre that this would there were two kids on one block who had rhabdomyosarcoma and so he started really um, being vocal about it and what is fascinating uh, to me when I interviewed him for my book was the reaction um, instead of people his neighbors rallying he you know some neighbors would approach him in his driveway and say will you just be quiet you're gonna make our our house value go down and um, they, instead of rallying behind him, they said, be quiet. And it's, it's really a terrible story of simply um, I think fear more than anything because the neighbors, of course, don't want to bring that into their own house, and they think they can close their door to it. Now, you're a journalist. In fact, you taught one of our producers at Columbia Journalism right. School. <laughs> so, of course, you went to Brookhaven, right, the National yes. Lab, to get their response. Mm -hmm. It was pretty limited. In fact, um, in <laughs> one of my later chapters in the book, I, I outline my one, one visit where I was sitting down with one of the representatives, um, and it was the one time that someone, it seemed like they were almost saying, yes, we could have been a better neighbor. Um, and the PR representative immediately said, this is all off the record. Where my, my recorder was out, everybody knew why I was there, um, and the, the meeting was, was ended. I was guaranteed um, a week of access, and I was given um, basically three days. And so after that first morning, I think after they saw the questions that I was asking, um, I, was, I was basically not given much access, but I did get into their library, and that's where a lot of the documentation from my book came from. They have a very, it's, it's technically a public library, except nobody can actually get into it. Um, and I spent hours and hours there photocopying all of their internal documents um, related to a lot of the spills and leaks and things like that. So, um, and just the kind of community um, public relations documents that were discussing how to handle the community in terms of telling them, you know, they really, diagnosed the community in terms of what they could get away with in terms of um, you know how much to tell us and how much not to tell us and 
at the at the meetings where they would address, you know, the scientists and the and the public relations people would address the the. Um, once the once the information about the leaks came out and these meetings would be held with the community and the scientists would make fun of them for not being able to pronounce some of what was leaking like strontium or tritium and and they would laugh at at, at them and that that arrogance as a resident yes and that arrogance was very similar to what Eric spoke about after Three Mile Island. Why do you need to know this? And yet the questioning, the activism, the journalism, mm -hmm. shut the last nuclear power plant of Brookhaven. Explain when that happened and how it happened. Well, it, um, it, it was sort of a surprise. They, of course, said it, it was de it was closed um, temporarily in the midst of the activism. Right. Technically, it was decommissioned because uh, there wasn't any more use for it. Uh, that's the official reason. But it seemed very obvious that the uproar had something to do with it and the leaks. Uh, Sheena, um, the latest news out of Vermont is that the state wanted to close the nuclear power plant with the full support of Governor Shumlin, who'd been a state legislator from the area of uh, Vermont Yankee. Um, El first was a supporter, but now the state has wanted to shut it down, and the legislature voted for this. But a court has prevented it from happening, prevented a Democratic government from closing down an entity of a private corporation. Right. And it's it's um, an interesting case for, I think, Indian Point, which is one of the um, places featured in our film, which Indian is up Point. for relicensing right now. In New York. That's correct. And in a similar situation, the governor there um, would like it to be closed. And, and so it's sending resistance. a real message, it this court is. case. You have a great clip in the film of uh, David Letterman saying he wants Indian Point shut down. That's right. Let's see what kind of pull he has, and maybe right. he could do more than the governor. We'll see. And talk about the other nuclear power plants and communities that you cover. Uh, another community that we go to is Braidwood in Illinois, um, which has a very similar story to Shirley Long Island. And as Kelly mentioned, one thing that was eerie to us is, is we went from town to town speaking to people. People. There were these unlikely activists. There were these, um, you know, moms and, and dads and grandmoms who were noticing that all of their neighbors were getting sick and would meet in each other's basements and kitchens and start to draw a map. Mm -hmm. And it all kind of starts with with dots on on a map. Um, and it's it's it was eerie to us how the story kept repeating and also how people were. Um, so, you know, necessarily busy and focused on their own communities, they almost don't have the chance to lift their heads up and look around and see that there are other people in other parts of this country dealing with the same thing. I want to go to the latest nuclear catastrophe, which was Fukushima, and ask you how that happening in the midst of your filming changed your view of things. But let's go to the clip in this film where we meet Paul Gallet, president of Riverkeeper, a group that's been actively lobbying to close the Indian Point nuclear power plant in Buchanan, New York, talking about the Fukushima disaster and how it reignited the debate over the aging plant. March 23rd. It is March 23rd, isn't it? The days are all kind of blending together right now. It's almost two weeks after the disaster in Japan. Uh, the news continues to get worse over there. We're sitting here in New York, and there are stories coming out every time you turn around about Indian Point. Could it happen here? What are the risks? Nuclear power. I don't want Indian Point. I, I live down the street. It's like at a cul-de-sac, and I'm just down the... I don't want that anymore. How can, how can we get them to take that away? The governor, we have, you know, For 10 years, Riverkeeper has been watching Indian Point from the standpoint of safety. In fact, even one NRC official said that if we had a chance to relicense that reactor, knowing no. today... We probably would not, not license, license that. Yeah, reactor. yeah, that's not that's, as the kids say a no-brainer. Before the Japan earthquakes, people were not paying attention to the risk of accident, risk of radiation release. Now they are. 
That's an excerpt from the remarkable documentary called The Atomic States of America, um, which is co-directed by Sheena Joyce and Don Argett. Uh, Sheena is with us now. Sheena, talk about Fukushima happening in the midst of you finalizing this documentary. Well, it, it was certainly um, unreal for, for us. We were actually on our way to um, South by Southwest Film Festival with another film that we had, and, and Don and I are also a couple, and we were packing, and we saw, you know, the crawl come across the TV first, that there was an earthquake in Japan, and my uh, cousin lived in Tokyo at the time, so immediately it was, you know, you think worrying about your family and what was going on, and then we had heard that there were nuclear reactors that had gone offline, and then suddenly our, you know, our stomachs flipped and our whole story changed. And we knew that um, not only, you know, would, would life be different for so many people on March 12th, but that our film would have to change entirely. So we kind of remade the film on March 12th. Um, it, it really did, it reframed our film, it, it reframed um, the dialogue in this country, and it, it changed our characters. So we had this new perspective, and, and I think what's worth mentioning, um, speaking again of Erie, is the last question that I would ask in every interview, no matter what side of, of the fence the person I was speaking to was on, I would say, well, what do you think it's going to um, take to make a change? What do you think it's, it's going to, you know, what would it take for people to start paying attention to this issue? And every single person, particularly, you know, on, on the anti-side, would say, I hate to say it, it's not a question, it's going to be an accident, and it's not a question of, of um, if, it's a question of where, when, and what will it look like. And people on the pro-nuclear side, did they say the same thing? They did not say the same thing. They... But did you find people changing after Fukushima at all, or just hardening their positions? Uh, you know, it's interesting. I think that there are some people who um, were interested in restarting a new generation of nuclear reactors. Um, they certainly are not for keeping the, you know, the old reactors, but even the, the, the pro-nuclear people who um, are interested in this new wave of, of um, generators um, may have changed their, their minds. Do you think it's changed the conversation in the United States around nuclear power? Has it in any way raised questions about this nuclear renaissance that President Obama is hailing? I think for the people who live in reactor communities, it has. I'm not so sure about the rest of the country. I guess we'll, we'll see. And I'm hoping, you know, as I said in the beginning, our goal with this film was just to ask questions and to try and spark a dialogue, and hopefully, you know, we can help that. Finally, Kelly McMasters, you don't live in Shirley anymore. I don't, but in a way, I always will, and so will everyone else as long as we have these reactors online. That was Kelly McMasters, author of Welcome to Shirley, a memoir from an atomic town, and Sheena Joyce, director of the Atomic States of America. The documentary premiered here at the Sundance Film Festival. Over